Good evening, I'm John Carter and welcome to Poland Daily. 30 tourists from Poland have sustained injuries in a bus accident that occurred near Antalya in southern Turkey. The wounded have been hospitalised and some of the injuries are considered serious. Spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Eva Suvara, has stated that the condition of victims is not life-threatening. As of this moment, four people with minor injuries left the hospital, out of the total seven who stayed overnight. The condition of the three people with the worst injuries is stable. It was upgraded overnight from life-threatening to stable. They underwent various medical treatments. One person had surgery of the face, the second one had their hand operated on, and the third has a spine surgery and was given a CT scan before any treatment will be done. We will have more information later. Today, the police are celebrating their 100th anniversary. The civic police were created during the fight for Polish borders. Today, over 100,000 police officers and 25,000 civil workers pay service to our country. The celebration was held at Piłsudski Square in Warsaw. According to a survey conducted by the Kantar workshop, only three Polish political parties will cross the electoral threshold in the fall. The ruling Law and Justice Party has the greatest amount of support. According to the Kantar workshop survey, only three political parties would cross the electoral threshold if the Polish parliamentary elections were held today. The Law and Justice Party, together with United Poland and the Agreement Party, would win with 39% of the votes. The Civic Platform Party would get 26%. The Spring Party would be the third party crossing the electoral threshold with 5%. Boris Johnson has been officially elected the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He visited Queen Elizabeth and gave a speech in front of his headquarters, located at 10 Downing Street in London, as per British tradition. Johnson has caused a stir amongst leftists in Britain with his politically incorrect rhetoric. He has also declared his backing of Brexit, although he has previously flip-flopped on the matter. Johnson's strong personality is currently dividing Britain, although much of the public are united in support of previous PM Theresa May's rule coming to an end. Britain's outgoing Prime Minister Theresa May said that her successor, Boris Johnson, had her full support and that she was pleased to hand over the position to him. May took over as Prime Minister in the aftermath of the 2016 vote to leave the European Union and is standing down just over three years later, having failed to deliver Brexit, with her divorce deal with the bloc rejected three times by a deeply divided parliament. Theresa May issued a parting shot to opposition Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn using her final weekly parliamentary question session to suggest he follow her lead and quit his job. To the people of this country, but I say to the right honourable gentleman, I say to the right honourable gentleman, as this is the last time that we will have this exchange across these dispatch boxes. Herself survived a confidence vote in December, but after her Brexit deal was roundly rejected by Parliament three times, she bowed to pressure from her lawmakers to let someone else take over. Speaking from Downing Street, Johnson said he was going to do a new and a better deal with the European Union as he promised to deliver Brexit on October 31st, do or die. I pay tribute to the fortitude and patience of my predecessor and her deep sense of public service. But in spite of all her efforts, it has become clear that there are pessimists at home and abroad who think, after three years of indecision, that this country has become a prisoner to the old arguments of 2016. And in this home of democracy, we are incapable of honouring a democratic mandate. And so I am standing before you today to tell you, the British people, that those critics are wrong. The Queen held an audience with Boris Johnson this afternoon and requested him to form a new administration. Johnson accepted Her Majesty's offer and was appointed Prime Minister and First Lord of the Treasury. The search team for the Institute of National Remembrance, led by Krzysztof Szwagczyk, have begun work in the former prison at Rakowiecka Street in Warsaw. There is a chance that the remains of the legendary Captain Witold Pielecki lie within the grounds. 
During the German occupation, soldiers and activists of the Polish underground state were murdered in the former prison at Rakowiecka Street in Warsaw. After the Second World War, members of the underground independence movement were met with the same fate. Today we have revealed human remains. This means we have confirmation that another area in the Rakowiecka prison hides human remains. We do not know yet what period they come from and whether they are victims of German or communist crimes. It is important, however, that they are found, which is of particular importance at the moment. While we are aware that this area will soon become a museum building site, which I think will happen soon, before this work is started, it is important that we check the whole area and examine it. Archaeological works are being carried out on the premises of the so-called Spacerniaki from the 50s, which were dismantled for the period of research. We are currently working in an area that until recently was occupied by the prison yard. It was recently dismantled. At the very edge of this field we have a series of burial pits, which we are exploring at the moment. So far we have uncovered the remains of three people. I think that this situation will change in the next few hours. We will have to wait for the identification of the victims. Genetic research that will help determine the period from which the remains originate will begin after the completion of the archaeological work. Genotyping will be possible very soon. Everything depends on the information gathered, the arrangement of the bodies, the depth of their burial, whether they have any artifacts or not, the arrangement of the remains, whether they have any wounds or not. All of this piques our interest, but this genotyping cannot be carried out until the activities in this area are completed. Professor Szwagrzyk predicts archaeological excavations in the area of the former prison at Rakowiecka Street will last about three weeks. This will certainly not be the last stage of our activities. We have to examine the whole area, so I think we'll need one more stage, and all the free spaces in the Rakowiecka prison have been examined already. The first exhumation work in the former detention center at Rakowiecka Street was carried out in July of 2016. According to historians, the remains of Witold Pilecki can be found in the prison. Witold Pilecki was murdered in this place 71 years ago after being sentenced by the communist court following a fake trial. So far, Szwagrzyk's team have managed to find the remains of Colonel Zygmunt Szendzielasz, Wupaszki, and Major Hieronim Dekutowski, Zapora, among others. Thank you very much for joining me here this evening at Poland Daily. I'm John Carter. Stay tuned after the break for Poland Daily Weather. It's followed by the business, culture, history, and then finally the travel. Welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tonight. Light overcast sky across the country without rainfalls. Temperature will rise, a maximum 17 degrees in Wrocław and 13 degrees in Koszalina and Olsztyn. Pressure will fall. And now over to tomorrow. Sunny day especially around Zielona Góra. In the rest of the country sunlight will appear as well. We don't expect any rainfalls that day. The temperature will rise to even 32 degrees in Wrocław. A little lower temperature we will see on the north between 22 to 25 degrees. Let's see what we can expect from the following three days. On Friday rainfall will appear on the northeast. In other region we will see plenty of sun. On Saturday rainfalls are expected on the southeast. Pressure will fall. And on Sunday scorching day across the Poland with temperatures ranging between 27 to 30 degrees. Thank you for watching and goodbye. Poland Daily Business Edition. Tonight we'll talk about energy and cash flows behind uh, that uh, energy uh, with Jakub Wiech, uh, Chief Editor of Energetyka 24 Paul Portal, sir. Thank you for coming Hi. to the studio and welcome. Uh, let us uh, start uh, from sketching the Polish strategy uh, of uh, energy. We know that our per capita energy usage is about half of uh, the other developed nations. So 
most likely it will grow. So what is the Polish strategy to provide enough energy to sustain the growth? Of the economy, the strategy was described in the document called um, "Policy Energy Policy of Poland till 2014." It was presented by the Ministry of Energy in November last year, and um, this document consists of a strategy of investments in uh, nuclear energy and uh, renewable energy, especially in photovoltaics and um, offshore wind farms, and um, this this strategy will actually support the economic growth of Poland uh, by well, creating a capacity in clean energy uh, and uh, well, transforming the Polish energy mix into a um, modern shape uh, by cl closing the from, from coal and uh, combined with uh, some new technology technologies actually that will um, be able to let's say escape from the uh, any sort of uh, climate restrictions mm -hmm. can we say about the numbers right now is what 80 percent of polish energy produced from the coal and yeah. lignites yes it's uh, actually above 80 so it's a, it's a vast uh, majority of polish mix is still uh, encoded in, in um, coal technologies and uh, we are talking about let's say cutting two thirds of it in the next 20 years and um, this uh, the space will will be uh, will, let's say built up by by nuclear power plants and uh, uh, photovoltaics and uh, wind energy by by most uh, but also there will be a space for for um, biomass and for for some uh, gas capacities okay the most uh, promising like in terms of cost and uh, like time of delivery which of those technologies you mentioned are most promising well actually it depends of course uh, renewables are very fast to to build and to to operate but we cannot forget that they are not the s stable ones they, they for example photovoltaics will not generate any power at night so uh, that's why we need some uh, more um, scalable power like nuclear power plants and um, this is uh, nuclear power technology is actually the the biggest challenge and that stems from the from the uh, Polish energy strategy to 2040 uh, and uh, actually minister Piotr Naimski said lately that um, Poland will be six. Uh, will build six reactors in next by 2040. Yes, that's that's correct. So that so we should start right now. Is it yeah, we should start early right now. Actually, at the moment, <laughs> uh, we have we don't have anyone and um, not a single nuclear plant. And the, the talks and discussions about building a plant uh, are ongoing since 1970s, I believe. So yep. there's a 40 years of constant discussion. Do we have any uh, result of this discussion visible? Well, the result is that we're st still highlighting the need for energy power plant in, in Poland, but actually we know nothing about the sources of finance uh, and uh, the, the um, delivery of technology. So at this point, we cannot say actually if, if the nuclear plant uh, is going to be built or uh, what, uh, what, actually, what technology will be installed there. Right. So but we know that the tar time of building the classical time, the generation two of the nuclear plant or the generation three is about 15 years yeah, from start to finish. Yes, and uh, actually it's very worth it to, to highlight the, the name of the person that said uh, about uh, these six nuclear reactors. It was P Mr. Piotr Naimski, the, the, the man who uh, signed the memorandum of understanding with Americans in, uh, in Washington during President Duda's um, visit. So it, it may be some kind of indication for the, uh, the the future of the Polish energy. So we may assume that uh, his uh, statement about six power plants came from the uh, discussions with the American partners. Yeah, I think that it will be reasonable to assume that um, Mr. Naimski's um, firm statement it has something to do with insight that he's aware of. And um, this insight may stem from the, the, the uh, talks that are ongoing with the Americans or any kind of entity that has something to do with the... From uh, your sources, are we talking about the classical high power energy plant or rather 
SMR small, small modular reactors? Uh, as far as I know, we are talking about um, high uh, capacities and uh, the, the, these big nuclear power plants. So there is, there is actually, uh, as far as I know, there's no need for SMRs. Uh, in, in Poland, we are talking about big capacities in nuclear power plants. Okay, big capital. Uh, expenditures and we will see how do we how we will acquire this capital for that yeah and this, uh, that's a great question actually and no one knows the answer as far in the the uh, media uh, and we can only speculate okay so we will uh, follow that issue because it's very very hot uh, thank you very much Jakub Wiech Energetica 24 uh, portal chief editor and that was it the energetical part of our poland daily business Welcome back to Poland Daily Weather. Let's take a look at the forecast for tomorrow. Sunny day especially around Zielona Góra. In the rest of the country sunlight will appear as well. We don't expect any rainfalls that day. The temperature will rise to even 32 degrees in Wrocław. A little lower temperature we will see on the north between 22 to 25 degrees. Now let's see the forecast for Europe. On the Iberian Peninsula temperature will range from 28 in Lisbon to on the Iberian Peninsula, temperature will range from 28 in Lisbon to 36 in Madrid. Temperature will rise in Scandinavia and there we will see 24 in Oslo and 23 in Stockholm. Plenty of sunlight on Central Europe. Thank you for watching and goodbye. How do art historians set the time boundaries of Cubism? Some set the beginning with the creation of the painting The Young Ladies of Avignon, but others point to 1906, 1907, and some years after that came synthetic Cubism, later anarchic Cubism. And the end date? Is it, as in the case of many other artistic movements, difficult to establish it? Exactly. As with Matisse and Fauvism, in Cubism we deal with such a powerful and influential genius as Picasso. His active influence on art exists until his death. He was a painter who lived as long as Matisse and influenced art in an equally important way, maybe even stronger. It can be said that as long as Picasso lived, the echo of Cubism in art still functioned, but it turned into an anarchist spirit, into doctrines that would blow up all the remnants of the past. So in this sense, Cubism somehow functions there as a painting formula. It ends quickly. This is because Expressionism is birthed on the basis of the Fauvist experience. And here again I must return to the three protoplasts of these trends. I spoke earlier about Cézanne, Gauguin and Van Gogh. Van Gogh is the progenitor whose work creates the artistic basis for Expressionism. I would like to interject for just a second here because people who are not very interested in the development of European art sometimes face a mystery. What is the difference between Expressionism and Impressionism? Both words are quite similar, both refer to emotions and feelings. Both trends in art also had some similarities as well as large differences. I think it is worth noting these differences here, so as not to make a mistake. First of all, let us note the fact that Impressionism is a trend which, to put it colloquially, was very focused on landscapes. The Impressionist artist analyzed the landscape in a painterly way. This is the main theme of Impressionism. And indeed, the analysis was chromatic. It was supposed 
supposed to evoke emotions, but only in the analytical sense. This means that what was emotional should not have been overly prevalent over the analytical form of the given motif. On the basis of the work of Claude Monet, the main impressionist, we can see a great example of this theory. The beginning of his work, i.e. putting dots on the canvas and analyzing the landscape, and on the other hand, the end of his work, painting water lilies, is crossing of this border. The water lilies he painted were already highly impressionistic. So two trends within the body of work of one artist. Likewise, it happened with Van Gogh, although it is hard to say that any of his periods of creation were strictly impressionistic. The initial parts of his body of work, apart from the stage of realistic painting, I am thinking here about paintings such as the potato eaters, it was only the beginning of his work when he was painting the landscape. He he was to be impressionist with the intention of Van Gogh itself. Nevertheless, his temperament was so strong that you can find the features of impressionism everywhere. But Monet is a great genius of impressionism, a symbol of impressionism. Indeed, in his late works, he foresees and announces expressionism. That is to say, the hypertrophy of emotion as a vehicle of expression over the analytical dimension. Although in Monet's pieces, these two trends are harmoniously connected, the next generation especially based on the achievements of Van Gogh, very easily pass into the area of Expressionism. In Expressionism, the subject is irrelevant. It can be a landscape, it can be still life, it can also be a human figure. It is all irrelevant, because the most important is the transition of emotions, emotions which are most clearly communicated. And one more thing. Why is it said, of course to simplify a bit, that while Impressionism appealed to emotions, it was rather positive. There was an admiration of the sense of beauty, harmony, something pleasant. And meanwhile, Expressionism appealed or evoked negative emotions, a sense of chaos, regret, despair. <laughs> Indeed, negative emotions as a characteristic of Expressionism, this is a reasonable statement. It is worth recalling Utrillo or Sustain, who in their work saturated with grief and drama, evoke these emotions and become the pioneers of this trend. Not only that, as we will definitely remember the main representative and his absolute masterpiece. Monk, the scream. It is really hard for us to break away from this impression. Anyway, we know that the artist had his own psychological problems at a later stage. All these great artists, Utrillo, Sutang, Monk, they all had a very difficult life, very heavy personal experiences, and expressing emotions was not an artistic concept, but certainly for these artists was their deep personal need, a deep existential experience. So, indeed, these features become the norm. It was seen in other examples of these expressive trends, especially German, with the works of Dix, Grosch. Here is where we go beyond the strictly picture arts, beyond the painting. In the end, expressionism is much broader than just painting. I was interested in film for quite a while. German expressionism was often invisible in movies. The first yet silent movies, for instance Dr. Caligari's office, was considered as a manifest expression of German expressionism. We all have these motifs there. It is not known whether it's a horror film or a record of mental illness, but all these motifs, including those deeply embedded eyes in some terrifying mask which is supposed to be the face, later came Nosferatu, Symphony of Terror, which was the screen adaptation of Bram Stoker his novel Dracula. Expressionism is far broader than painting. Na ekran powieści Brama Stokera Dracula. Tutaj rzeczywiście ujawnia się cała ta szerokość też szerokość. Definitely, yes. 
Here, the entire breadth with which expressionism portrays reality is revealed. What you said was very important. You pointed out that it touches on all those areas. Let us remember that, for example, German expressionism in painting describes not personal feelings and experiences, as it was in the case of artists whom I mentioned earlier. German expressionism described social experiences, experiences of war, because we are already entering the period of great slaughter. We experience a moral fall. Grosch was so fond of drawing, in a very beautiful and suggestive way, the underworld of prostitution, those streets of Berlin, drunk and girls of light morals. In fact, expressionism becomes a social trend with social meaning, and in this sense, it is also a ground for critical contemporary trends. It is the first trend that goes deeply in its specificity and style in describing social and political experiences. The big breakthrough in the entire Latin civilization is approaching with great strides, and and art plays a significant role in this breakthrough. Thank you very much for today's meeting. Marcin Bonk. Bardzo dziękuję, Marcin Bonk. Janusz Janowski. Welcome to Poland Daily History. Today we are visiting the city of Czechanowicz on the northeastern side of Poland and the Krzysztof Kluka Museum of Agriculture. They are organizing a medieval fair, or rather an event focusing on the lifestyle of the nobilities during the 18th century. Join us as we delve into the various aspects of the Polish nobility's life during the time when Poland was under partition. So the combination of today's event focus on the reenactment of the armed conflict between two noble families in the region known as a foray. And I was wondering if you can tell me about the foray, how do they take place, how are they resolved, and what do they look like in general? The history around forays is very deeply rooted in Polish history. To this day, everybody associates forays as something typical for Polish culture, as well as for the ideology of the Polish nobility known as Sarmatism. It is most commonly associated with the epic poem titled Pan Tadeusz by Adam Mickiewicz. However, it must be remembered that such solutions to issues between powerful families were not typical for the traditional Polish culture. The same conflicts were encountered in contemporary Europe too. It is only with time that the central power of the states becomes so strong that it simply does not allow for such solutions to disputes. If we discuss the situation that prevailed in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, we have a completely different situation. In the West, the monarchies were getting stronger. Here in turn, over time, the the royal powers were decreasing more and more. Hence, the growing will to resolve conflicts independently, whether they concerned land, cattle, income from various types of ponds or fields. Therefore, this type of conflict resolution was very common in the 17th and 18th century. I actually committed a faux pas today by wearing this outfit without a saber. This was indispensable for the traditional Polish culture and for the noble culture. The saber was very useful, as sometimes the cause for such attacks was a personal dispute between two people, two feuding families. Oftentimes these conflicts ended with a duel of two people. We also divide these attacks into two categories, the first being a legal attack and the other a private attack. A legal attack was carried out according to law upon obtaining a court order that the appropriated procedure, the so-called intrigue or seizing of the disputed territory, should be carried out. However, if this was not effective, then the next step was contacting the governor. They had the duty to support the claimant and convene nobles from his jurisdiction. Wtedy uciekano się po pomoc starosty. Starosta miał obowiązek 
Together, they fought with the claimant. Over time, though, the legal attack was gradually disappearing until it disappears completely around the second half of the 17th century. Now, the private attack becomes more and more common. The nobles began to take matters into their own hands, yet still had to follow a set procedure. If somebody wanted to conduct an attack on a neighboring estate, they could not do this in secret. The person to be invaded had to know the attacker. Very often, they were neighbors. Not only did they have to conduct this openly, the person who was to be invaded had to be informed of the intentions of the foray. Only after announcing your attack to the opponent did the military operations begin. Very often, it was done on a much smaller scale than we would think, because there were attacks in which as few as 10 invaders participated. However, in the historical sources, we also have examples of invasions in which even seven 70 or more people took part. The nobles, of course, had to initiate a given attack, but it were mainly the peasants from their estates that were actually doing the fighting. In some cases, for example, the neighbors and friends were also invited to it. The use of military units was a frequent procedure, particularly during wars. If the army was stationed nearby, then their help in this type of operation was used very often. W tego typu zajazdach. Forays could at times be state sanctioned, but were often private initiatives, meaning illegal. Next up, we will ask an employee of the museum, Mr. Eric Kakovich, about how a nobleman would react after having fallen victim of a foray. So once someone had their land taken, what do they do afterwards? Do they go to the king, file a complaint, or do they gather their best friends and try to take revenge and get them back? Taking people's land was a crime and was naturally prosecuted. Such cases have been preserved, for example, in municipal court files. Complaints of this sort have been reported to such institutions numerous times. However, it were the moderately affluent nobles that submitted complaints to such courts. If we talk about the poorest gentry, most often they did not bring their case to justice and rather took justice into their own hands. They often gathered a large enough unit to attack and respond to the attack that had met them. So they tried to regain what was stolen from them or to compensate for this loss in some other way. If, however, a given nobleman who was invaded had a powerful protector, for example a magnate whom he served, he very often sought his help in settling such a dispute. Thanks to the protector's help, such disputes were often resolved. Often, when it comes to this type of attacks in Polish culture, it was a bit different than in Western Europe. It happened that not only men organized attacks on someone's goods, they were often women or noble spouses, especially during the war. They were collecting troops themselves, very often they used troops which were passing through the area. The soldiers then were hired, and often such a lady invaded the property of a neighbor with whom she was in conflict. There is a case of a lady who compiled a military unit, probably paid off Saxon soldiers, that also survived in the town records. She hired them to invade her husband, with whom she was in conflict. It was even necessary to calm her down, so that her claims would not be too eagerly, and that his health would not be compromised. So speaking of this foray here that's being uh, reenacted, how did how did it end? The inspiration for our historical reenactment show here today were the events from 1784. Michał Starzyński then served as the starost of Pransk, whereas his district was bordered by the Ossolinski estate. Józef Ossolinski, acting to the detriment of the starost, with whom he was at odds, decided to put a dam on his section of land, which fed the starost's mill. And because of this dam, the mill 
could not function. At the time, Starosta Stejinsky went to the estate of Józef Osolinski. He met him, but Osolinski did not want to change his decision. The dam was to remain. At that time, the Starost decided to bring justice on his own accord. He collected peasants and subjects from his estate. Together with them, he went to the place where the dam was built. He told the peasants to demolish it and told his armed forces to protect them. Then it came to a personal skirmish between Józef Osolinski and Michał Starzyński. The men had argued to the point that it almost came to a duel between them. Fortunately, however, the father of Józef Osolinski was present. He told his son to calm down, and in the end, the duel did not materialize. The case ended amicably, but for the purposes of our event, our imagining will be more bloody, the fight will take place to a bigger extent, it will be done with the use of cannons and will end with an optimistic accent. We want to involve our ladies, who are also dressed in costumes of the era, to chase the fighting sides away at the end of the party. One will pretend to be Countess Stajenska, the other Osolinska, and they will tell off their spouses. As we have seen today, the Polish nobility faced a wide range of problems at the end of the 18th century. Most prominently, the loss of national sovereignty due to infighting. Nevertheless, they were able to preserve their culture and tradition throughout centuries for future generations to admire. That's it for today. I'm your host, Benjamin Lee, and I'll see you next time on Poland Daily History. And it's time for another edition of Poland Daily Travel. This time we're taking you to Płock. That's right, that ancient capital of Poland, northwest of Warsaw. It's only a hundred and some kilometers, but it's almost a world away from the hustle and bustle of the nation's capital. Płock is famous for its situation on a bluff high above the Wisła. Its cathedral is known as one of the five oldest churches in Poland. Its location is at a junction of ancient shipping routes which made it a very important medieval city. Nowadays it is the home of the Museum of Mazowsze with its excellent collection of Belle Epoque furniture. And that's before you even consider the city's most uh, original asset. And that asset is the longest pier on a river in the whole of Europe. The pier extends out into the wide Vistula and provides a natural harbor for smaller boats, mostly pleasure craft and some smaller fishing boats. So when you're in Warsaw, Płock is not that far away. It's an enjoyable day out. You'll have to get your car. There's no train service there. You might take a bus, but it's worth it to see the beautiful countryside between Warsaw and Płock. So stay tuned as Poland Daily Travel takes you to princely city of Płock. Poland Daily Travel, your favorite travel programming about Poland. And welcome back. And as I said, we're going to look at some, uh, some of these precious articles, and I'm going to you know, see what I might like to you know, get later. Um, <laughs> don't tell anybody. What about, OK, I'll cut you in. What, what about this thing, uh, uh, Magajada, what, this statue? Uh, yes, as I, as I said uh, earlier, uh, the motif of a dancing woman was very popular in that time. Okay. Uh, it was based and inspired uh, by a real dancer, American dancer, Louis Fuller. Okay. okay. She inspired uh, Art Nouveau artists yeah. to show modern dance because she uh, discover modern way of dance okay. with lies, with special uh, moves. Uh -huh. And this statue um, came from manufacture from Czech, uh, from Cieplice. Uh -huh. uh, it was famous manufacturer Amphora. Gosh. Uh, and what's it made of? 
uh, with terracotta. Terracotta. It's beautiful. What about, what is this? Come here. It's a gramophone. It's a gramophone. What is yes. a gramophone? Record player? Record player. Here's an actual yes. record. Yeah. Re record. Uh, Can I take this and they, show it to people? Yeah. Look at that, folks. That's an actual record from the period, an early record. That's what they looked like. And they were played on this gramophone, right? Yeah. And how would you do it? Uh, the, you put the, um, the record, is record here. here, and you uh, should turn the things you here. You turn the crank there. The crank yeah. here, and the music shows from here. From this, there's like a big ear. Yeah, yeah it's like, like a working big on ear. the principle of an ear. Yes. It's fantastic, isn't it? Let's go over here. Um, what about this? Uh, this come, is come and this me up here. set this, of furniture. Yeah, is yeah, this of, headboard, etc. Yes, what is all this? It's typical for Art Nouveau style because okay. um, the designers were, wanted to um, compare the furniture with architecture of the interior. Okay. So that's why you have a wooden um, obudova. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, this thing. This headboard, thing, headboard, the headboard, headboard. Yeah, yes. I, I guess it's almost like In a, which you can, um, yeah. uh, you can put, you can put the sofa or through bed. the, you or a bed yeah. uh, through the it's wall. It's a headboard, yeah. yeah. Come on, come on, let's see what else we got. Here's a writing desk. Yes, writing desk for a woman. She could uh, write letters here because uh, you can close it mm -hmm. and it looks very, uh, pure and simple. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Every woman should have one. Let's move yes. on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what about this? I wanted to ask you about this. What is that? This is a sculpture of German uh, German artist and mm -hmm. also motif of woman. But uh, motif of woman uh, compared with butterfly. It's a woman as a butterfly yes. instead of a mermaid. <laughs> it's a butterfly, right? Yeah. Because it's a figure of a woman with the butterfly wings. Very yeah. nice. And, and again, that's symbolizing this, um, this curves yes. and the lightness yes, and, of course. and all of those things, isn't it? And here you have yeah. the portraits of um, uh, ladies yeah. from that that's time, right. yeah. and special um, uh, dress, uh, so you can see uh, uh, how the uh, fashion looked like, women, uh, ladies' fashion, right. this was very special. Yeah. We ha also have in our collection a uh, rich collection of um, of uh, fashion. Yeah, uh, you can see how. Th look fashion. at this lady, this uh, mm -hmm. sort of uh, uh, athlete, athlete dancer, yeah. right? Yes. I yes. love this too. These sculptures of the of the women are very flattering, I think, mm -hmm. don't you? Yeah. Yeah, because they're strong, but at the same time delicate. It's yes. A, yes. It's a, you you have to remember that it's the time of. Uh, new um, look at uh, um, woman, uh, mm -hmm. uh, femme fatale, for example. The femme fatale comes right out of so this. So very strong and very delicate. Yeah. Speaking of femme fatales, I think I've got one with me right now. And she's a little too smart for me, but I'm glad she's here because otherwise I wouldn't know very much about this stuff at all. We'll be right back with the next exciting segment with Magajata with me at the museum in Płock, the Secessia Museum, the Museum yes. of the Museum, Belle Epoque. Mazovian yeah. Museum, but yes, Mazovian a collection Museum. of Art Nouveau. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll be right back. Come back and see the next program. <laughs> 